welcome everybody to the June edition of the Gateway to the Stars. Uh, this is a joint program of the National Park Service, the St. Louis Astronomical Society, and the International Dark Sky Association, the Missouri Chapter. My name is Don Fick, and I'm an amateur astronomer, a member of the St. Louis Astronomical Society, and also president of the International Dark Sky Chapter of Missouri. And joining me tonight is Rich Pfefferman. He's a park ranger with the National Park Service, a long-term uh, amateur astronomer, and also happens to be a member of the St. Louis Astronomical Society. We have a fun program tonight. It's about a 90 minute program. Uh, the, it's, it comes in two segments. The first segment starts here in just a moment. It's called Finding the Way with Lewis and Clark. Ken Porter is a retired educator of Missouri Department of Conservation and a reenactor. And we actually pre-recorded this video, although we do have him live here for some questions after the segment. I think you're gonna find this a lot of fun to learn about navigating the stars. The second program uh, start about nine o'clock. It's called Virtual Stargazing, and it will feature Rich Pfefferman, who's a park ranger we just mentioned. And he'll be doing a, uh, actually we're gonna play a pre-recorded video of him using a software called Stellarium that'll talk about how you can navigate the night sky. And he does a great job through that. And then he'll, will be around here at the end for questions. And that'll be followed at, with Mark Jones, a member of the St. Louis Astronomical Society. Uh, we anticipated last night that it would be cloudy tonight, so we went ahead and pre-recorded uh, a viewing of the moon. We'll be talking about the moon Apollo landing sites. And so I think it was a wise decision, and you did a great job, and I think you're gonna have a lot of fun with this. So as a tr we are streaming on Facebook Live, and so we are hoping to take questions at the end of each of the segments. Uh, you can see us, but we cannot see you. But if you can just type your questions into the Facebook page, we'll be monitoring that. And uh, hopefully we'll be able to get as many questions as possible answered tonight. And I think you're gonna have a lot of fun. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna close this out and um, we're gonna start a pre-recorded video that uh, will be finding the way with Lewis and Clark. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to tonight's Gateway to the Stars program. We have an exciting schedule of events uh, set up for you tonight. Our first program is going to be with Mr. Ken Porter, who is a retired educator and reenactor uh, with the Missouri Department of Conservation, and he is going to talk about uh, finding your way with Lewis and Clark, basically how Lewis and Clark made their way to the Pacific Ocean, the instruments and techniques that they used to create their map and make it all the way to the Pacific Ocean. That'll be followed by uh, my presentation, which is going to be a tour of the night sky, virtual stargazing at the Gateway Arch, uh, following Mr. Porter's presentation. And then lastly, we will have hopefully live video footage of the moon taken by an amateur astronomer with the St. Louis Astronomical Society. So we hope you enjoy tonight's event, and we will get started now. Hello, I'm Ken Porter. Today I'm going to be talking to you about the Lewis and Clark expedition and their making of maps to the western United States. I'm dressed as an 1803 military private. The weapon I have here with me is one of the issue weapons for the expedition. This is an 1803 Harper's Ferry rifle, 54 caliber. This is the Lewis and Clark grocery store. There were no McDonald's or, or anything else between here and the Pacific Ocean in 1803. If they didn't trade for it or shoot it or catch it on a, on a hook, they didn't eat. So this was a vital piece of equipment for them. This is the standard military uniform of the day. This starting off here is my class A cover. This is what I would use for parades and fancy occasions. Uh, later in the program, I'll show you the fatigue cap. You'll notice the jacket is nice and colorful, but the rest of the uniform is white. And nowadays everybody's uniform is, is uh, camouflaged. 
But uh, back then, the country was so poor, they could not afford to have colored uniforms. So they wore white uniforms. And this was not a group of shaggy face mountain men going west. It was required everybody shave every, every three days and you had to get a haircut every month, even out in the wilderness, that uh, we would divide up into teams. And because my brother was also on the trip, we were a team, we'd cut each other's hair and we would shave each other. So you wanted to be very careful shaving your partner uh, because uh, if you were a little rough with him, when it was his turn to shave you, he might be rough with you, okay? So this was a very well-organized expedition, and that's one of the reasons they were able to do the, all the mapping, is because they had to be able to coordinate with each other. As I said, the Lewis and Clark expedition was a military expedition headed by two captains. They left from Fort Dubois, which was at the confluence of the Missouri and the Mississippi rivers. The whole expedition was started by President Thomas Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson had been interested in, in the Western United States you know, for most of his life. In fact, Thomas Jefferson had one of the best libraries in the country, and many of his books were on the Western United States. Unfortunately, at that time, there were some misconceptions about what was in the Western United States. Jefferson actually believed that it was, might be possible to find Mastodons, which were in the area. If you go just south of here, down uh, Highway 55, uh, you go to Mastodon State Park, where we have the bones of the Mastodons who used to live here. So they did used to live here, but there were no live ones left for the expedition. He also thought there might be the giant ground sloth. The giant ground sloth found bones, but that's it. They thought there might be a mountain of salt. They didn't come close to finding a mountain of salt, but that was one of the things that was talked about. One of the other major things Thomas Jefferson thought they might run across were Welsh Indians. The expeditions had gone out previously looking for the the blue-eyed Welsh Indians, and they never did find any of those. Every time they got to a new tribe on the Missouri River, they'd ask them about the uh, Welsh Indians, and the tribes would say, oh, they're beyond the next tribe up the river. And they kept going up the river, and they never found them. The other thing that Lewis and Clark uh, were supposed to be looking for and probably the most important part was an all-water route to the Pacific Ocean. From an economic standpoint, this would have been fantastic. It's a long trip around uh, South America to get to the Pacific Ocean. That was long before the Panama Canal. And so it took a long time to get around there. And the Northwest, Oregon, Washington, had a great fur industry. Originally, Thomas Jefferson approached George Rogers Clark, Hannibal of the West, hero of the American Revolution, to head an expedition to the West. And this was before the Louisiana Purchase. They were going to go on a scientific expedition that uh, would have been theoretically all civilian, but obviously with George Rogers Clark leading it, it wouldn't be civilian. Strangely, George Rogers Clark is the brother, the older brother of, of Clark on the expedition. In, in fact, Clark studied his survey techniques and map making from his brother, George Rogers Clark. That uh, there's in existence a textbook on survey that uh, has notes by both the Clark brothers in it. While they were working on getting an expedition put together and not having a lot of luck, a strange thing happened. The Louisiana Territory was originally French, 
But after the, the French lost a major war back in 1763, the, the Peace of Paris gave the Louisiana Territory to Spain as reparations. Well, after Napoleon got in there, he convinced the Spanish to repatriate the Louisiana Territory to France because he was trying to set up a Western Hemisphere empire. He was going to grow sugar, the sugar cane, down in the Caribbean, and he was going to feed the slaves they were using to harvest the sugar cane. He was going to feed them with grain that came from this country right here, what they referred to at the time as the Illinois country. And unfortunately, the whole exercise fell apart, that uh, the yellow fever went right through his troops, the slaves revolted, uh, his whole sugar empire fell apart. During this time when, when everything had fallen apart, one of the Spanish officials, a bureaucrat, closed down the United States from using the port of New Orleans to store goods until a seagoing ship could pick them up and take them where they were going to go. They called that the right of deposit. And they took away our right of deposit. So Jefferson sent a deposition to France to negotiate to buy the city of New Orleans so we would have the port. Well, Napoleon knew he could not possibly keep enough troops in the United States to uh, protect it from everybody. So he, he said, instead of just the port of New Orleans, I'll sell you the whole of the Louisiana Territory for $15 million, which was a lot of money back then. And we didn't have any money. That's why we didn't have any colorful uniforms. Didn't even have money for dye. But uh, the British loaned us the money and you have to remember, this is only 25 years after the American Revolution. We didn't get along all that well with England, but England didn't want the French to have it. They didn't want the Spanish to have it. They were busy themselves fighting Napoleon. So they loaned us the $15 million to buy the Louisiana Territory. So when Lewis and Clark went forward into the Louisiana Territory, it was American territory. Lewis was in St. Louis for the formal proceedings of, of raising the flag. Lewis and Clark, Clark on the left here and Lewis on the right, they were co-captains on the trip and they got along amazingly well. They started off their, their trip, one of their missions was to map from Camp de Bois all the way to the Pacific Ocean. Now this is like taking off for the moon without having any kind of map at all. They did have some mapping already available. More had gone on in the West than most people realized at the time as far as mapping was concerned. Alexander Mackenzie is a Canadian. He went from Montreal to the Pacific Ocean in 1796. And he wrote a book about it which Lewis read very closely. Now where he went through obviously was all in Canada, it wasn't in the United States. Also, just a few years before this, 1793, Captain Robert Gray discovered the mouth of the Columbia River. People had sailed right by the Columbia River and did not notice that there was a river there. But Captain Gray sailed into the estuary there and named the river after his ship, the Columbia. And so that's how the Columbia River got its name. And also, while he was there, he obviously took readings with his sextants to determine the exact position of the mouth of the Columbia. Also, there was an earlier expedition by Mackey and Evans. Mackey was obviously a Scotsman and Evans was a Welshman, and they made maps going from St. Louis up to the Mandan village in North Dakota. 
So Lewis and Clark started off with a little bit of information on the maps. They copied all of Mackey and Evans' maps, and the French boatmen they hired, the engagés, a lot of them had been up and down the river quite often. But mapping was a prime consideration because with maps of the area, Jefferson felt this would give him justification for claiming the uh, Western United States for the U.S. because we had been there and we had mapped it. They were not dressed quite like this at the time. Uh, they were in uniforms like I'm in right now. To do the mapping, they needed to have the equipment of the day. And you'll notice Captain Clark here on the left is in his military uniform. And this is an officer's uniform. My uniform is that of a private. And Lewis was trained in navigation back in Philadelphia. You'll notice in, in this one that the red hair here, that means this drawing here happens to be of Clark. Clark was a redhead. He even carried an umbrella with him on the expedition, which was wiped away in a flash flood. But he carried all the cartographic equipment with him, even though they, they didn't have everything they could have used. It was a long trip. Here in the upper right-hand corner, this is an artificial horizon. This is a very important piece of equipment. This is the sextant. We can tell it it's a sextant because it's, it's over 120 degrees on this scale down here. But the most important piece of equipment, strangely, is this watch here. This watch is actually a chronometer a very highly accurate watch that tells you what time it is in Greenwich, England. Also, they had compasses, and as they called them, spyglasses, telescopes. And this is Clark's original compass that went on the trip with them, at least a reproduction of it. You'll notice on this style that they have everything divided off into quadrants here, and the quadrants will come in into importance a little later here. The other thing they had with them was nautical almanacs, and inside the nautical almanac for the objects they were tracking, this would tell them exactly where it was, what point on the earth it was, it was over. The basics of navigation are always, where am I and what is around me? Now, to determine our position on the planet Earth, we need at least two coordinates. One coordinate is latitude. That's the lines running parallel to the bottom of the slide. Like a ladder, just like rungs in a ladder, latitude is easy to determine. The, our problem gets to be with longitude, the lines that run from the North Pole to the South Pole. With the latitude, we have three coordinates. If you go outside and you, you stand out there, if you start walking north, if you walk long enough, you're walking south. If you keep walking, you pass the equator. If you keep walking, you pass the South Pole. You have three points where you can definitively say exactly where you are. With longitude, you get out front out there and you turn west and you start walking, you walk west forever because there's no markers. Well, they found you had to designate a point out there to measure your longitude from. Well, everybody got in the act. The British obviously got in the act with Greenwich. Kyoto in Japan had a prime meridian. Peking had a prime meridian. Everybody had prime meridians. In fact, they even made a movie about one, the Paris Meridian, the Rose Line. Uh, they, they had a movie, The Da Vinci Code, which was all based on this Rose Line, which uh, the French don't keep a secret. There, there's little brass markers in the middle of sidewalks showing you where the Paris Line is. Unfortunately, with so many of them, 
you couldn't tell what was going on, so they finally got together. The British were the power at the time, so the line that went through the British Observatory at Greenwich, England, was picked as the prime meridian, and everything is judged east and west from that point. Time equals angle. If we go back one slide here, you'll notice all of these circles are divided up into 360 degrees. That uh, the Babylonians gave us uh, the base 60 and uh, 360 degrees in a circle, which worked out perfectly fine, actually. The whole world is divided up into 360 degrees. And the problem with, with longitude is that we have to be able to reference back to a point. With latitude, we've got the North Pole, the equator, and the South Pole to relate back to. But with the longitude, we only have a made-up line out there that everybody has agreed to. But we have to relate back to this, and the way we have to relate back to it is with time. If to stand outside for 24 hours, the sun goes completely around and comes back to overhead again. In the sun's course, doing that, it goes through 360 degrees. To divide that by 24 hours, the sun has to move at 15 degrees an hour. So this means if you get a longitude reading of 15 degrees, you are one hour away from Greenwich, England. So you can tell where you are. So time is equal to the angle. 30 degrees is two hours. And your chronometer, if it gets off by a little bit, which uh, Lewis and Clark had some real problems with, you can reset the clocks by observing the moons of Jupiter. And this is the main reason they had the spy glasses was to do the moons of Jupiter. Now to get those angles, to get that 15, 30 degrees, whatever angle you happen to have, you need something to measure the angles. Back in the olden days, when I worked with a lot of fourth grade students doing programs, we would have a program where we worked on angles and degrees, and we would make what I refer to as a Porter's Quadrant, which has 90 degrees in it. This is nothing but cardboard. They learn to use their protractor to put on. All you really need is, is 90 degrees. You don't need the whole set here. You just need 90 degrees. And then on top of that, you glue an astronomical sighting device. Strangely, the Subway Sandwich Shop gives away these astronomical sighting devices. They actually use them to drink their sodas and such. They're just a, a common straw. And then you, you put a hole in your cardboard, you hang a string from it with a heavy weight of some kind. That heavy weight will always point to the center of the earth, given the chance. So if you go out at night and you look through one end of the straw at the star Polaris, this will give you your latitude. I'll draw a little diagram in a minute here to show you that. Just a, an easy way to get your latitude. Also on, on this slide, you'll notice in the upper left is a sextant, and a sextant has a scale of at least 120 degrees on this curved bar on the bottom, and an octant, which has at least 90 degrees. So this is a quarter of a circle with at least 90. One important mathematical calculation, which is well known to fourth graders, is corresponding angles. And this is important in our evaluations here, that uh, if you have two parallel lines and you traverse them with another straight line, the angles they formed are matching. You'll notice here that the two red angles, number one and number five, these two angles are exactly the same. Three and seven are exactly the same. All of them are equal and they're called corresponding angles. Fourth graders pick right up on this. I, they jump on that topic right there. A sextant is basically a fancy device for measuring angles. You'll notice it has two mirrors on it and the mirror on the bottom down here was normally a half mirror to where you look through your eyepiece and half the mirror 
you can see the horizon. The other half of the mirror, you see the picture coming from the sun or star, whatever you're observing up here, and you move it back and forth with this scale here, and this will tell you the angle between the astronomical object and the horizon. And this is the picture in the upper right that you would see looking through the scope here. On the right hand side you're going to see the sun, the left hand side the horizon. You move this back and forth until the sun comes down and the bottom limb just barely hits the horizon. Then you take a reading on here. In using a sextant, the sextant was obviously originally set up to be used on the ocean. In the upper left hand picture here, you can see the little boat here and you get the angle between the horizon and where the astronomical object is. The depth that's referred to here is the distance you are above the horizon. Six feet plus the height of the boat, whatever it is. And you have to bring that into the calculation because that, that will change the angle. On land, you can see from the picture on the right, you don't have a horizon. Your horizon isn't flat, it's mountains, it's whatever is out there. So we have to use an artificial horizon, such as in the lower left here. You have to use an artificial horizon. Lewis and Clark had three different artificial horizons depending on, on the lighting conditions. But you can see from the drawing on the right that uh, the light from the sun comes in and there is a fluid, usually water, in this. And the artificial horizon not only has sunshades on it, but it keeps the wind from ruffling the surface of the water. Later explorers like Zebulon Pike use mercury, which is pretty heavy all in itself, so it doesn't get wrinkles on it, and you can just use a bowl of it if you want. As an expedient in the field, you can take a pan full of water and use it. I often use the bird bath in the backyard as, as a reflecting service. I live in the Ozarks, so I've got to shoot over the trees. The only problem with doing it this way is you end up doubling the uh, angle when you do this, and so you have to divide by two. All fourth graders can divide by two. They're very good at that. Fourth graders are more amazing than you think at times. Now, Polaris, on the far right in this picture, labeled as Polaris the North Star, is important because it only varies a half a degree on either side of being exactly on the North Pole. Back in the times of Lewis and Clark, they used this little dipper as a clock. If you look right down here on the lower left where it says Beta Cocab, that's Cocab. And these other stars, now back in there, those days, before we had all our light pollution, they didn't show up as well as they could, but you could still see them. Nowadays, you sometimes lose most of these stars, but you can usually still see Cocab unless you're too close to, to St. Louis. And then there is a problem with the light pollution. But uh, everything here amazingly moves at 15 degrees an hour. So if you're on a night watch and privates like myself wouldn't have had a watch, and you're supposed to be relieved at, at midnight, how do you know when it's time to wake up your relief? Well, you know by watching this co-cab, it amazingly moves at 15 degrees an hour, just like the sun, just like everything out, outside of the Earth, except our own solar system, moves at 15 degrees an hour. Now this is a quadrant. You can see it has a straw on the top and a weight, and the degrees marked across the bottom. At night, you can take this out and cite Polaris and pinch it there or have someone else read it, and it will tell you, in this case, uh, it would set right there at about 38 degrees. And that's, that's our latitude right here. And 
just in case someone ever asks you exactly what's going on there, that uh, if Polaris is up here, okay, all the light coming from Polaris is parallel. It's so far away, it's parallel, so the light from Polaris, the North Star, would just come right through the Earth like that. Okay, now if we are right here, but there are lines through here, this is our zenith, this is straight up. This is the horizon. Now right there where, where those two lines cross, that's 90 degrees. Okay, so we know that's 90 degrees. We also have the light from Polaris parallel to this line coming through that point. We take our angle measure, which can be as a simple piece of cardboard or a sextant or an octant, whatever you've got. All we're measuring is just the angle. This just takes no spherical trigonometry. This is simple. We measure this distance, this angle right here, which we call height, and that is the height, angular height of Polaris. We refer to this as the co-height, and we know from that being 90 degrees that co-height plus height equals 90 degrees. At the, so we can always keep that straight. That if we look, whoop, whoop, what we're after here is our geographic latitude. And we look over here at what angles we've got. We can tell to get this, it's the same as this angle here. In fact, it is that angle there. Okay. If we look up here, where is that angle again? It's right here. So this is the co-height here, and the co-height plus the height equals your geographic latitude. And so, it, it's, it, 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 this has been determined by the ancient mariners for a long time. They could always measure their latitude. Now Lewis and Clark, in order to establish their points, used the noon site. Now the noon site sounds like it would be very complicated, but it's not. We start off with, with, the, with the same earth here, and we're just gonna start off with, with part of it. We don't need the whole thing. We have the equator here, We have north and south. We're over here. There's our horizon. And there's our zenith. Now what this is going to give us is our longitude. The sunshine Okay, we can throw the sun to sign parallel just like Polaris. So far away, it's all, it's all the same when it gets here. But again, we take our angle measuring machine, 
sextant, octant, whatever, and we can get this distance here. And what we do is we start off and we go out and we take one measurement with this angle and note the time it is in Greenwich. Okay. We take another angle and the angle has increased. Take another angle and the angle has increased. Take an angle and the angle has decreased. This point here is noon. The sun is at its highest point right there. And so we take a, take a look at the time for that. Over here, with, with, the, with the space we've got right here, this height of the sun above the equator is known as declination. Declination is you can get out of your almanac or you can get out of, uh, if you just think about things a little bit, in two days, we're going to reach the summer solstice. The summer solstice is 23.5 degrees, which is the tilt of the Earth. Then after Saturday, the, the sun's going to start going down. It, uh, so to get our geographic latitude, Okay. We have the declination this distance here. Then we have this distance here. So we have to look up here to, to, to get our what this distance is and the distance is the height. So our geographic latitude oop, is, is this distance plus this distance. Because here, here's the parallel lines, here's the intercepting line. So the co heights here and the declination add up to the geographical latitude. And what this will do is it will give us a point on a map. And now we're going to go back to the slides and talk about the compass a little bit. Compasses on the trip were really very important. They not only just point north, but they give you a reference. First, you have to have a point where you know exactly where you are on the Earth, latitude and longitude. And we can see with the noon site, and they had nine stars that they tracked to uh, determine their latitude and longitude, so they knew the point at which they were. But points don't make maps. What helps make maps back then was the compass. Now compasses came wandering in from China rather late and by 1700 they had determined that they had a real little quirk to them. Compasses point north but they point toward magnetic north and sometimes as you can see by a large amount and with compasses they talk about that as declination, but navigators always use the term variation because declination, as you can see from the previous section, declination is used for the height of celestial bodies above or below the equator. So Lewis and Clark had to compensate for the magnetic declination. And from the previous map, you can see this is a declination map fairly recently here. You can see over here where it says zero. Zero is right next to St. Louis. This is called the agonic line. 
the compass needle points to the magnetic and geographic pole. Unfortunately, th things are moving a little quicker now than they used to, but Lewis and Clark had to account for that. And one of the ways of doing this, and the most simple, is by using Polaris. Polaris is just about due north. So at night, if you get your compass out and see what direction it's pointing, and then compare that to where Polaris is, the angular difference between the two is your declination. This little line right here, that shows the declination, the distance between the two readings and what you have to add to or subtract from your compass reading. And so that, that this will, will help keep us track of what direction north is, which you'll see in just a minute is, is very important for the map making part of this. Now just as a, as a point, the magnetic north pole moves. And in fact, you can see from, from this table here that uh, in the past it's just been kind of moving slowly up toward the date line. And then suddenly here, just recently, it's really jumped up. Some scientists think we might be getting to the point where we're going to reverse poles again, where the North Pole will become the South Pole. It's happened before, so it, it's not like it's something that, that anybody's going to panic over. Well, let me take that back. Somebody might panic over it, but it's just going to flip your compass over. But Lewis and Clark used the compass in their map making. It's a system called Compass Transverse Mapping. In the journals, you'll notice quite often Clark will have to have a section in there about where they went for that day. And this is the, the form in which he would put it in there. He would note the miles, how, how far each section was, and he would report the direction in a way today we consider unusual. He would put south or north if it was due north or due south, but if, if it was at an angle to north or south, he would say south 28 degrees to the west, okay, south 10 degrees to the east. And he would always state in there some type of landmark he could use to check it if he had to. They did a lot of backsighting once they had gotten to a certain point, they would shoot back the other direction to check their readings. At the, where it says starboard here, this is the right side of the vessel. If you look at the Bordeaux tapestry and other paintings and drawings from the Middle Ages, you'll notice the steering board is on the right. And that's what this is, starboard, steering board is the right side of the boat. Larboard, in this case, is the left side, and larboard is now known as port because this is the side of the boat that you put up next to the dock because if you put up the right side against the dock, you'll break the steering board, which is just hanging over the edge. Okay, Clark, at night, he would sit around the campfire and draw small maps. And he made many of these small maps for every day. He would take those readings he had recorded and as, as the river went down this way, he had gone from here to here one and a half miles and on the larboard side there was a rock like a tower. This distance here, they were using graph paper so he could scale that out and the direction of this, the first one he said it was south, just pure south. The next reading, oh, we're gonna go two miles 
and our compass reading to get down here to a pile of bushes was two miles and our compass reading was south and it would be let's see 20 degrees west and here at this point of land river comes around this way and the compass reading is south 20 degrees east Whoop. I made a slight mistake here it wasn't west it's coming back east And this is west. Clark would draw this up and he would have the, the miles in here. Okay. And every day they travel someplace that he could, he would make up little maps like this. Then at Fort Mandan and at uh, Fort Clatsop, he would put all of these little maps together into a bigger map. And so th this is a very simple system, but you can see he's really dependent upon his compass readings. And so it was important to keep those compasses working fine. So he uses the latitude and longitude to get a physical point and then he can from this map that over here in this direction is a huge mountain now he might not know how far away that mountain is but from here he can get a reading of what's his compass direction where is this mountain then he can draw that mountain on there even though he's a little unsure of what this distance is he's not sure but he would draw up all of these little maps like this and they would also as you'll see in just a minute uh, they, they, they would would uh, use maps from Indians and from everybody else. This is actual types of equipment that Lewis and Clark would have had on the trip. Obviously the rifle I talked to you about earlier, that, uh, which was high tech for the time. It, it, it was you know, a, a much shorter barreled rifle than, than was common in the day. This is the sextant. You'll notice with the sextant, this arm has, has a release down here it moves the arm back and forth and if you watch this mirror up here that mirror moves back and forth and all this does is the very same thing this piece of cardboard a fourth grader made does it measures angles and it doesn't just measure horizontal angles if you hold this on its side you can measure the angular difference between two mountain peaks or anything else that's out there that you're looking at that you need angles on you can get it with this this works too all we're getting in navigation is angles but this is is the basic piece of equipment it has sunshades on it that particularly when taking noon sights we have a real problem back in the olden days they had a condition called navigator's eye navigators would gradually go blind in their right eye no matter how many of these shades you put down no matter how dark you made it it impacted your right eye and navigators would would soon lose their ability to see out of that eye nowadays we don't have that problem but back then that was a real problem with with navigators we have much better sunshades today but this is your prime piece of equipment is your sextant it gives you angles 
The other big piece of equipment is a chronometer. A chronometer is nothing but a very, very fancy watch. That the, in fact, this was the most expensive piece of equipment on the trip. $250.75 for the key to wind it, which Lewis and Clark did not always remember to do. This is important, and this had the time in Greenwich, England. Not here. This is what you use to get noon here. Like I did in the diagrams earlier, you keep taking readings as the sun goes up and up and up and up and up. And when the angle comes down, you know you've been through noon. So someone has had to be there during each of these sightings to write this down. The angle and the time. And you always write the time down first because the angle is, is recorded right here. It's, so you can always get that, but the time, your watch keeps right on going, so you need to t put the time down first. This is an artificial horizon. It's a very simple piece of equipment. Lewis and Clark, as I mentioned before, had three of these. He would normally put water in them, and the little container like this is to keep the wind from ruffling the surface of the water. If you try to sight through and the water is going up and down or rippling back and forth, you, can, you can't get, uh, get your readings correctly. So this keeps the wind off the water. If you need extra help with the brightness of the subject, you have pieces on there that are also sunshades. Now, like I say, Zebulon Pike used, used mercury, Lewis and Clark used water, but this is the artificial horizon, which was a very important piece of equipment to them. This is a reproduction of the Elkskin Journal, that, uh, which they made on the trip. This is what they recorded the information in. The information is no good if you don't get it written down. You write down everything, which was a little confusing to uh, some of the later people going through Lewis and Clark notes. If they did, they recorded everything. So they have tons of stuff, to, not just a series of booklets, but uh, many booklets, pieces of paper, and everything else. The very important piece of equipment on the trip, the compass, and it, it, this is a reproduction of Lewis's compass. You will notice on the compass that it doesn't have 360 degrees around the edge of the compass here. From north and south, they have the numbers going up from both directions rather than just a series going around with 360 degrees. They're designed for the transverse mapping. And so when Clark went out there, he knew that this is what he was going to do. So this, this is the type of compass he used. It, obviously, this is not the real one, but they do have the real one in, in, in a museum. This is the Class A cover. None of them survived the trip. This cover here, this is the fatigue cap made in the French style out of your old uniform trousers. At, uh, so th 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 these were their, their two hats. And this one is meant to kind of scare people off a little bit. You know, without my, my cover on, I, I, I look meek and mild-mannered. But when I put this on, suddenly I'm taller and meaner, and hopefully everybody will leave the field of battle because uh, I scare them off with my hat, I would hope. And that, that's the equipment that uh, they carried on the trip. Lewis and Clark, when they first started out, they knew where they were and they knew where they were going, but they didn't know what was in between. When we went to the moon, we knew exactly what was between us and the moon, and we, we had everything down to an exact science of exactly what was going to go on when. Lewis and Clark knew the latitude and longitude 
of Camp de Bois, so they knew where they were starting. They knew the latitude and longitude of the mouth of the Columbia River, thanks to Robert Gray and later explorations by Vancouver, so they knew basically where they were going. They had maps that went up to North Dakota, thanks to Mackey and Evans. But even the Native Americans really couldn't help them much on the big bend in the Missouri River up here at the top. When, when the Mandans would go raiding out west to uh, capture other Indians and cause general mayhem, they didn't go by river. They went by horseback straight across from the Mandan village to uh, you know, the area around the Yellowstone and the Idaho area, all in through there. So when Lewis and Clark asked him about the river up here, the Indians really couldn't tell them anything because they didn't go up that way. Part of the reason they didn't go up that way was because the Blackfeet were up here. And the Blackfeet were kind of like the Comanche. You just didn't want to push them any, or the Pawnee for that matter. So they knew pretty much the first part of the route, but the rest of the route, they had no idea. The Rocky Mountains, they were thinking of them more in line with the Appalachian Mountains and they thought the Rocky Mountains were only one range. And so the first time they got a look at the Rocky Mountains, they were shocked. The Native Americans didn't even cross over them very often because unfortunately where Lewis and Clark chose to cross through the Bitterroots is probably the hardest place in the whole Rocky Mountains from California to Canada that you could cross. But they did have that information, so they knew about where they had to go and how far, but they had no idea of what was there. As they went along with their maps, they put notations on them for all kinds of things to match their notes and the journals. Is the soil good? Is the soil not good? You know, here it talks about short and arrows where you're gonna have trouble navigating with a vessel. They recorded all the information they possibly could. And they recorded them in, the, in these small maps using this compass transverse method that, uh, to make the smaller maps to put together into the larger maps. This is a map of the falls, the falls of the Missouri. They're all covered up now by dams and such but uh, that's their original drawing of the Falls of the Missouri. But they also used information from Indian groups. This map here is of the Columbia River Basin, and it notes the tribes along the river. This is a map by Sitting Rabbit. He was a Mandan. You can see that the, the Indians, when they worked on maps, they used lots of pictures. This picture up here at the top is not an airplane. It's crossed snowshoes. You have to remember when Lewis and Clark were going through here, this was at the end of the Little Ice Age. It was much colder through here at that time than it is today. So they have crossed snowshoes up here, but you can see all kinds of little drawings of, of things all over the Indian maps. On the way back from the trip, they retracked all their calculations. Clark dropped down to the Yellowstone River and uh, went that way to get more information and to see if it was a better route. Actually, any, any route other than the one they took through the Bitter Roots was, was a better route. And they'd been gone so long, you know, two and a half years, they met trappers coming up the river and their mapping and their exploration, and particularly them telling everybody of all the resources they had found out there, all the beaver and everything, they were the start of the manifest destiny. They provided the information and the impetus to settle the Western United States. All right, folks, uh, 
That ends the first video, and we do have a few moments for questions. Actually, Ken Porter is online right now, and I'm going to try to get over here and see if I can get some questions from if we have any questions right now. There's a question. Uh, hang on a second, Ken. I'm going to unmute you, I think. Ken, are you there? Yes. Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can. There's a question about if they actually had fleas at one of their campsites. Do you know anything about that? Fleas? Yes. Is, it, is the bug? Yes. yes, they were. They were. Uh, they were. They were often vexed by many of the the uh, small creatures along the route. That gave them as much trouble as the big grizzly bears. The insect that bothered them the most, though, were mosquitoes. And they often complained about the mosquitoes, and being they spelled phonetically, they spelled mosquito about 26 different ways. <laughs> uh, mosquitoes haven't changed too much, have they? No, they haven't. And since some some of them were pretty big back then. So I have another question from a viewer, and they say, "How do they measure miles?" Uh, they, they, they measured miles uh, two basic ways. One was by a log, uh, which, which is basic, basically a piece of wood that they put in, in, the, in the river behind them and play a piece of string out so that they can tell how quick the, uh, <coughs> the vessel is traveling in relation to the current. And also, they did it by dead reckoning. Now, that they, they did have metal chains, which were two poles long, 32 feet. They had, they had these chains where they could get out of the boat and physically measure things if they needed to. But uh, Clark was a very good surveyor. He learned very well from his brother, George Rogers Clark. And so he could estimate the miles very accurately. In fact, for an 8,000-mile trip, mainly guessing at distances, and this included time when they were starving to death going over the bitter routes, he was only off by 40 miles for that 8,000-mile trip. So he, he did a, a fantastic job, and it was dead reckoning that people were better at doing distances back then Land was a very important thing. This was why the, the Americans were were headed west, is uh, tobacco wore the land out. So you had to keep getting new land, and this meant you had to be very land savvy. Uh, George Washington was a surveyor. A lot of important people were surveyors at, at part of their, their career. All right. Well, that's good, Ken. I think uh, it looks like we're running a little tight on time. I, that was really great. We actually answered a couple of the questions online. I think we we're able to take care of that. Well, that was really great. There's a lot of great math in there. And as an amateur astronomer, um, I understood quite a bit of it, but I uh, would love to understand more. And I thank you very much. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, basically move up to the next section. And that's going to be a Stellarium video with uh, Rich Pfefferman. He's an, uh, he's an art National Park guy. Uh, employee and also an amateur astronomy and a member of the St. Louis Astronomical Society. So I'm going to go ahead and start that and guys that are on this call here with my helpers, I'm going to go ahead and mute everybody here so we can play this. Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. We're going to talk about the night skies. I'm going to take you on a virtual tour of the uh, night sky at this time of year. First, let me introduce myself. I am Ranger Richard, and I have worked at the park for a long time. I was hired as a seasonal park ranger way back in 1988 and have been here ever since. And uh, a long-term interest of mine has been observational astronomy, and I got excited about the stars. Uh, I'm old enough to remember the moon landing very well, and like a lot of people, I got into astronomy that way. 
got my first telescope when I was nine years old, and it's been a big interest of mine uh, ever since. Uh, for my career, though, I went into history rather than astronomy, but still, looking at the stars has been, been a big hobby of mine, really, for 50 years now. And our park was nice enough way back in 2009 to send me on a special detail at Bryce Canyon National Park. And there I learned about how they present astronomy as part of their activities. And so in 2010, the Gateway to the Stars program was born. And I have sort of an unofficial title as Sky Ranger here. So now we'll get into a tour of the uh, night sky. Well, of course, uh, if it's a clear night outside tonight, the first thing that everyone will notice in the sky is the first quarter moon. And the moon is in the southern sky at this time of year. This is a slightly magnified view, but just a little bit bigger than you would see to the uh, unaided eye. So this is a view of the moon with a small telescope and the first thing you really notice is that the dark areas are called the maria. They're areas where lava flowed early in the uh, moon's history. And uh, the areas mostly at the bottom are what are called the lunar terra, very heavily cratered areas where countless meteors landed and created holes or craters in the moon's surface. The next slide shows a close-up of the moon. The round uh, maria here is called the Mare Chrysium, or the Sea of Chryses, and then you have three in a row, and the middle one is the famous Sea of Tranquility, the Mare Tranquillitatis, where the Apollo 11 uh, astronauts landed 51 years ago, and right about here would be the site of the uh, first man landing on the moon on July 20th, 1969, right at the edge of the Sea of Tranquility. Here's a close-up of the very heavily, heavily cratered uh, Terra at the uh, southern part of the moon, and you can really see down here, uh, the smallest crater you could see in this magnified view is probably about two or three miles wide. Some of the larger craters can be as much as 50 to 100 miles wide, and you get a good view with a decent telescope. You can see this uh, level of detail on the moon. As the sky gets darker, about 9 o'clock in the evening or later, you can face east and see three bright stars that form the summer triangle. The star Vega up here at the top is one of the brightest stars in the night sky. Its light takes about 27 years to get to your eye. It's a relatively nearby star. Altair to the lower right is much closer, about 16 light years away. The dimmest of the three, Deneb, is actually fantastically far away. Its light takes 1,500 years to get to your eye, so it goes back to uh, just a little bit after the time of the fall of the Roman Empire. And these three stars really dominate the eastern sky at this time of year, Vega, Altair and Deneb make up the huge summer triangle. We'll turn and face north, and of course, one of the most famous landmarks in the sky would be the Big Dipper, which is part of a much larger constellation, Ursa Major. The four stars that form the bowl, and then the three that form the handle trailing off to the right. And the two stars in the bowl that are farthest from the handle, if you draw a line through them, they always point directly to the north star, Polaris. Now we're very lucky in the northern hemisphere because Polaris happens to be directly above the north pole of the Earth. If you drew a line from the center of the Earth's uh, core through the North Pole and drew it out into space, we're lucky that it points to a pretty bright star, 
the North Star Polaris. And through the year, you would see the Big Dipper revolve around the North Star. But it's a handy landmark in the sky because it helps you point out north. If you look at the star that's at the bend in the handle of the Big Dipper sometime, you will notice it looks just a little bit odd. If you have good eyes and a dark sky location or use binoculars, you will notice a little tiny star right next to the brighter one. The brighter star is called Mizar. The little star is called Alcor. And legend has it, it used to be a test of vision in ancient times. Now, if you put a telescope on Mizar, you'll, of course, see Alcor quite far apart from it. But the telescope would show that Mizar is itself a very close binary star. A pretty cool thing to see in the sky. So look at Mizar and Alcor that form the star at the bend in the handle of the Big Dipper. You could use the Big Dipper to locate other objects in the sky. And this is an old mnemonic I was uh, taught as a kid. You can follow the arc of the Big Dipper's handle, follow the arc to a very bright star called Arcturus, and then you could speed on or spike to Spica, which is at the south at this time of year. And then you can continue or curve to the stars of Corvus, which make up a box-like shape. So kind of cool, arc to Arcturus, speed on or spike to Spica, and continue to Corvus to locate three more things in the sky. Now, at this time of year, at this time of night, the moon is in the south, so it might make it just a little bit hard to see Spica and Corvus unless the sky is uh, very clear. Another thing you could see is in the southeastern sky. You will notice a pretty bright kind of reddish orange star. Its name is Antares. And if it's a good clear night, you may notice three stars in a row that form the head of the scorpion. With all the city lights around St. Louis, it may be hard to make out the shape of the scorpion. If you get out a little bit ways towards the country, you will notice it sort of looks like a curved fish hook of stars, sort of. It does have Scorpius, a little bit of the shape of an actual scorpion in the sky. If you stayed up late tonight till around 10.30 this evening, you will see two bright stars. They look like stars rising in the southeastern sky. You might need to find a spot without too many houses or trees in the way. They are not stars at all, though. They're actually planets. Jupiter, very bright on the right, and then Saturn to the left. And so those are the first two planets we can see in the sky this evening. This gives you the view of Jupiter as seen in binoculars. And if you have a good pair of binoculars, seven or 10 power, you may notice one or two of Jupiter's moons that are right next to the planet. With a small telescope, you can usually see Jupiter's four largest. They're called the Galilean moons because Galileo found them with the first telescope that was put to use for astronomy. Uh, they orbit around Jupiter, but they're all in the plane of Jupiter's equator. So they kind of shift back and forth so that they could be on one side of Jupiter or the other. Occasionally, one or two of the moons can appear in front of Jupiter or behind it, so you don't see all four. Tonight, you have two moons on each side of Jupiter, but it can be three on one side, all four on the same side. Any combination is possible. Also, with a small telescope, you can start to notice a couple of stripes or cloud bands in Jupiter's atmosphere along the equator. Here's a high power view of Jupiter now, and you could notice the cloud bands in Jupiter's atmosphere very well, not just the two that flank the equator, but there's others towards the poles. And on a good night with a powerful telescope, and if it's facing us, you could start to make out the great red spot uh, at the edge of Jupiter in this view. 
if you were to have a popular vote, many people would say that Saturn is the most beautiful object that can be seen in a telescope. And a view like this is quite possible with a decent scope. You can see the rings around Saturn. If you look very closely, you may notice a line which divides the rings. It's called the Cassini division. And you could notice two or three distinct rings on Saturn with a decent telescope that can magnify 100 times or more. Again, very, very beautiful. But uh, even to the unaided eye, you can see Saturn and Jupiter at about 1030 at night. In fact, Jupiter and Saturn are currently close together in the sky. They will be all year. And in December, they will be the closest that they've been for many years. If you were to stay up very late tonight, about 1.30 in the morning, you could start to pick up Mars as a bright orangish star in the southeastern sky. Jupiter and Saturn are in the south then, and if you drew a line through them way to the southeast, you will see Mars as well. So a third planet uh, is visible. Jupiter is the brightest of the three, Saturn the dimmest, with Mars just a little bit brighter than Saturn currently, and noticeable by its orange color. Mars is sort of a difficult object to see very well in the telescope, but currently, if you had a 100 power or more telescope looking at Mars, you will notice what are called albedo features, darker patches on the planet. Uh, this view doesn't show it, but you also currently could see the uh, south polar ice cap at the uh, upper edge of the planet, but not visible in this uh, computer-generated view. The next thing, if you would like to see four planets at the same time, it's quite possible, but you either have to stay up really late or more likely get up early, about 4.30 in the morning. It's actually worth it to see four planets at the same time. By then, Jupiter and Saturn are in the southwestern sky and Mars is in the south. And then brightest of all is Venus, which is in the northeast. So get up early sometime the next couple of weeks, and you can see Venus in the, in the northeast, Mars in the south, and Jupiter and Saturn in the southwest. Not often can you see four planets at the same time. Now, honestly, you don't have to always get up at this hour to see Jupiter, Saturn, and Mars, again, as early as about 1.30 in the morning, you can see them, or they'll make their way over to the evening sky later this summer and fall. But Venus is going to stay in the morning uh, for the next several months. Maybe some of you remember seeing Venus in the evening until the end of May. Then it passed between the Earth and the Sun, and it is now a morning star and will be for quite a while. Now, if you put a telescope on Venus, since it just recently passed between the Earth and the Sun, it's going to look a lot like a beautiful crescent moon uh, currently. Or if you have a strong pair of binoculars, about 10 power, you will notice that Venus's shape is currently that of a, a little crescent. Now, I'd like to give you some hints on how you can explore the sky a little bit better. Uh, don't underestimate binoculars. They give a great view of the moon. They help you uh, locate objects that are pretty dim in the sky or low in the twilight. And I recommend myself either 10 by 50, 7 by 35, or 7 by 50 binoculars. The first number is how powerful they are. The second number is how large the lenses are. And binoculars are great because you could use them to bird watch uh, at, uh, at uh, uh, plays and other events. Binoculars have a use besides telescopes. 
A lot of people like to use star charts to explore the sky, and the best way to read them in the dark, you kind of have to solve a problem, because if you have a bright flashlight, that will ruin your being used to the dark. So I always suggest using a red flashlight, and one thing you can do is to use red nail polish to paint the lens of an old flashlight they're not using anymore, or you could try taping some paper bag layers over it. Uh, or it is possible to buy a lot of uh, cheap red flashlights online. They're not too expensive. Whenever you use a star chart, it's important to turn the chart so that the direction you're facing, the name of the direction, is at the bottom. And then if you do that and then hold the chart over your head, it will read correctly. Uh, most star charts show a lot more stars than you can see from a brightly lit city, and that's where you can use the binoculars to kind of fill in the blinks sometimes. Many people who are really into astronomy want to buy a telescope, and I always suggest that people kind of test drive them. And the best way to test drive a telescope is to go to a star party and local organizations here in St. Louis. The largest is the St. Louis Astronomical Society, but wherever you live, you can probably find an astronomy club and, you know, take a chance and uh, go to one of these star parties and uh, look through a variety of different telescopes. And a suggestion would be the best telescope is not the big, fancy, expensive one, but one that's really easy to set up and use and get to know and will use often. Now, I'm going to suggest a few websites here, and this is not my own personal opinion, not the opinion of the National Park Service. Uh, Skyandtelescope.com is a good website to uh, view, especially the part that's called Sky at a Glance, has a weekly update on sky events. So Skyandtelescope.com is a great resource to uh, keep up with the events in the sky. Another good one is spaceweather.com, and they have updates on solar activity, and there's a great gallery which shows uh, pictures taken by amateur astronomers. Some are really good, some are what you and I could probably take, not at such a high level. Heavens Above, with a dash in the middle, heavens-above.com is a great resource to locate the International Space Station in the sky or other satellites. So that's one of my favorite sites as well. And if you're into apps, Star Walk is a great one, or Stellarium. And Stellarium is the program that I use to generate most of the slides that we saw in tonight's program. Another great resource that I would be remiss if I didn't mention would be slasonline.org the website of the St. Louis Astronomical Society. They're the largest local club. They offer monthly meetings. In-person meetings are held at Washington University on the third Friday of the month. Currently, they're presenting online meetings using the Zoom format, and they also host frequent star parties around the area. Uh, they have a library telescope program where you actually can borrow a telescope from many of the local St. Louis libraries, and that's a great way to get your feet wet in the field. So the St. Louis Astronomical Society is a, a great resource. Even if you don't live in St. Louis, it's really good to locate your nearest astronomy club. Well, that concludes my tour of the night sky. Uh, I'd like to encourage you all to attend next month's event. Uh, next Gateway to the Stars program will be on Saturday, July 25th. It's our annual Kids Explorer Night, and children between 5 and 12 years old can earn a Junior Ranger Night Explorer patch. At this time, we're not sure if it'll be possible to do this event in person or online, so keep up with the Gateway Arch NPS Facebook page to keep track of all of our programs at the park, not just Gateway to the Stars.
Coming up next, we're going to have live video from a telescope that's being operated by a member of the St. Louis Astronomical Society, if the sky is clear tonight. Uh, if it's not clear enough, we'll have some live video instead. So to see this part of the program, go to www.facebook.com slash STL Astro in order to continue with the live or recorded video. Well, thank you for attending tonight's program. I hope you all have a pleasant evening. Okay, folks, we're basically going to transition now directly to the video that was done. Uh, we anticipated correctly that tonight we would have cloudy skies. And so we actually recorded last night the moon in a live shot. And uh, we'll right after that, we'll have a few other things and then have some Q&A. And we've actually got Mark Jones online tonight. He can help us answer some questions when we get to that part. So, and by the way, for those of you who are ribbing me a little bit, yeah, that's my screensaver. That's not actually the moon. <laughs> the flowers are not on the moon. That's on my screensaver. So let me bring up the video and let's get going on this guy here. This was a lot of fun, by the way. All right. Good evening. This is Mark Jones with the St. Louis Astronomical Society. Right now we're looking at the moon. The moon is around uh, six days old. It just went through new moon about six days ago. You may have heard that there was a solar eclipse that took place in Asia uh, only six days ago. And now we're looking at a phase of the moon where sun, the sun is rising over some prominent mare or oceans on the moon. These are lava plains. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to slew the telescope so that the center of the moon is in the center of the field of view of the, of the video image. And in particular, I want to focus in on I want to focus in on a, an Apollo landing site. This is from Apollo 11. You remember that in July of 1969, Apollo 11 landed on the moon, spent about a day on the moon. The astronauts only spent a few hours outside their their uh, landing craft to to collect samples and take photographs and and things like that. And I landed in the southern area of the Sea of Tranquility. So this, this area here is the Sea of Tranquility, and the Apollo 11 astronauts landed right down at the very you know, the southern edge here of that uh, lava plane. So we're going to try to zoom in on this location, get a closer view. It won't be quite as sharp. And we'll center it up here, our image. You can see the large lava plains. These are fairly smooth regions. There are craters after the lava uh, cooled and solidified on the surface of the moon. Then later on, additional impact craters struck, uh, additional uh, meteors impact of the surface and create these extra craters you see here. All right, so here's a closer up image of this area where the Apollo landing site was. Uh, we usually look for it off of this, this promenade here of mountains and this uh, crater called Mulkey sitting here. And the, the approximate area of the Apollo 11 landing site is right up in this area here. Seeing conditions are not as good as they were, were a little bit earlier in the evening. I could actually see one of the smaller craters sitting over here. Uh, there's three craters in a row. There's Armstrong, Collins, and Aldrin, named after the three uh, Apollo 11 astronauts. And then uh, after they landed and, and they, they walked around the moon, they only got around two to 300 feet from, from the spacecraft. That's all the further they, they could go within the brief time that they had. Their mission was to really find out what the moon surface was like and pave the way for later, for later missions. And of course, we know we had uh, a number of later missions. And the final mission was the Apollo 17 mission. 
very ambitious. We're going to slew up to the northern end of the Sea of Tranquility, and we're going to center ourselves on an area called the Taurus Litro Valley. This is an area of the moon that scientists felt they have some very interesting features, including some uh, early crust that may have been ejected from, uh, from early uh, asteroid impacts on the moon. So they were very intrigued with this area. This area right in here, this little U-shaped area we see right here, the valley, Taurus Litro Valley is right in here. Um, the, what's called the North Mastiff is over here and the South Mastiff is over here. Um, this area of the moon where they were, I was very, it was flat, but it had these sloped sides on the other side of it and they felt that maybe some of this ejecta had, they saw high resolution images that showed uh, large boulders rolling down the hills here. And they wanted to go and collect some samples from those areas, particularly along this ridge. This ridge extends about 7,000 feet above the landing site. So these mountains towered over the, over the landing site uh, to the south. And then, and then over here on this side, uh, these, these ran about 3,000 feet above the landing site. So once again, if you've seen pictures taken by, uh, by the Apollo 17 astronauts, you'll notice those very tall peaks uh, looming, looming in the distance. Uh, they were able to travel using their lunar rover about seven miles uh, from one side to the other of this valley in order to collect samples, much further than uh, any of the other previous previous Apollo missions. I think they, there were only three missions that had rovers, and Apollo 17 was the most ambitious in terms of its distance, about, about seven miles. I think Apollo uh, 15 and 16 were or more like three to five miles distance from, uh, from one side to the other in terms of the total total area covered. Uh, Apollo 17 was also ambitious because they did travel up and down some slopes. Most of, most of the areas that the astronauts landed were very flat, and they never went too far up down, up hills or down, down into ravines. And typically, their altitude or elevation didn't vary by more than uh, maybe 100 to 300 feet. But in the case of this area here, they did they did go to to the, an area down here at the base of this mastiff here that was around 800 feet below the landing site. So uh, and of course they had to drive back up that slope to get back uh, back to the spacecraft. So if everything wouldn't have gone gone well, they would have had a, a, a pretty long trek uphill to get back to their uh, back to their spacecraft. So those are the two Apollo landing sites I wanted to show you that are visible in this this time of the lunar month. If we zoom back out again just for perspective. Once again we have the Sea of Tranquility here. We have the southern edge of the uh, Tranquility and the area where the Apollo 11 uh, spacecraft landed. And then if we go up to this upper end up here, we get up to the Taurus Littoral Valley where the last Apollo mission landed and took off. So I think that's all I've got for tonight. If you have any questions, please let me know. Okay, so what we're going to do now is we're going to move to a few slides. Uh, we've actually got some cool pictures of the telescope he's using, and he sent us a few extra kind of things here. And I'm going to let uh, Rich Pfefferman, Park Ranger Rich Pfefferman, talk a little bit about those slides. And let me get it started here. And Rich, I think you can uh, talk now. Is that right? Yes. Okay, great. Yes, and this is, uh, and, and of course, Mark, you're welcome to comment as well since you're on, but uh, this is the uh, telescope that was used to record the, uh, the video that we just saw, uh, and uh, light enters through the top, hits a mirror at the bottom, and then comes back, and then you look through the 
eyepiece uh, and uh, a camera is placed at the other end. We can move on to the next slide. Yeah, there's a close up of the camera. It's a very nice setup. And as you can see, it records a very, uh, very good, uh, very good uh, video. Uh, and we don't just have uh, the moon. Uh, Mark was also nice enough to send us a couple of still shots of a few what we call deep sky objects, objects beyond our solar system. And uh, these objects are hard to see unless you can get at least a little bit away from the city. Normally we have these events outside the arch on the entrance plaza, and it's hardly ever dark enough to locate uh, much more than the moon, planets, some of the bright stars. I can only remember once or twice in all the years, uh, this is the 11th year of our star program where we were able to show any deep sky objects, but Mark was able to bring them in from his suburban location. And uh, right now uh, we have a view of a, what's called a globular, as in a ball, a star cluster. Its name is uh, Messier 3. Uh, Charles Messier was a French astronomer back in the 18th century. He actually drew up a list of objects that look like comets. Uh, that was his main interest, hunting for comets. And uh, if you don't have a very powerful telescope, M3 looks just like a little fuzzy patch, and many comets look just like that. So in a sense, objects that look like comets but weren't. But if you can magnify Messier 3, you can see it's made up of countless stars. And this image does begin to show uh, the uh, stars resolved in uh, Messier 3. Uh, Messier 3 is uh, pretty far away. It's uh, looks like it's uh, 34,000 light years away from Earth, and it's estimated to have half a billion stars. Uh, the uh, uh, globular clusters that are in our Milky Way galaxy are sort of arranged in a halo around the uh, kind of the outskirts mainly of the uh, Milky Way, but they're great objects in telescopes if you have uh, a dark enough sky to uh, resolve the individual stars. Uh, we can go on to the next one. The Ring Nebula. And uh, this one might be a little hard for you folks to see online, but you might see a kind of Cheerio in the middle. Very dim smoke ring. And then now we have highlighted a much more uh, uh, a magnified view with a very large telescope to show. But you can see the ring shape. Uh, we're looking at the future of the sun. It's believed that someday the sun will become first a red giant star and then it will lose hold of its outer gases and eventually leave a very dense white dwarf star behind in the middle. And the white, uh, the white dwarf star actually will light up the uh, remnant gases and uh, create the smoke ring. Uh, we don't have enough magnification here to see the central star within within the ring nebula, but you can definitely make out uh, you can definitely make out the uh, uh, some people say it's the Cheerio in space. You might say uh, the ring nebula is about two thousand five hundred light years away, and folks think about that. The light you're looking at from these objects has been traveling for thousands of years to get to your eyes. And remember, the speed of light is about, uh, about 186,000 miles a second. So you go from the Earth to the moon in a little over a second, and it takes 2,500 years for light uh, from the ring nebula to get to your eye. I think we have one more. Next slide. And that's uh, uh, Messier 13. It's the famous Hercules cluster. Uh, it's uh, not quite as far away as M3. It's about 22,000 light years away in the direction of the stars of the constellation Hercules. And uh, that uh, this uh, globular star cluster uh, resolves more easily. You can see more of its component stars uh, than you can with M3, mostly because it's closer, because I believe both of them have about the same number, uh, half a billion stars. Uh, Mark, uh, feel free to interject anything about these uh, objects. 
Well, these are some of the best summertime, late, late spring and summertime objects that you can see. And a lot of the, all three of these, you can actually see with binoculars. Rich mentioned earlier about using binoculars. And we, we would recommend probably a, a, a 10 by 50 binocular. It's 10 power and 50 millimeter aperture. And with that, both of the globular clusters you see here are visible in your binoculars. Now they will look as a fuzzy or out of focus star, but you will be able to see those with binoculars. And then if you have a library telescope, uh, even the ring nebula will, should be visible through the, uh, through the library telescope. So these are, these are wonderful objects and some of the brighter examples of, of objects that are located beyond our solar system. And uh, if you if you would like, I can have a, I can make a few more comments about about the moon, some of the the moon shots that we took earlier. We showed the video earlier. Sure. So if we have time, I would be glad to share my screen. You should be able to do it, Mark. I think. Okay. Let me see if I can. Uh, properly share my screen here. Let me see if stop share. Let me stop share here first. All right, looks like I'll be able to start here. Oh, uh, it says the host disabled it again. All right, so one second here, just a second. Click that again for me. Yeah, I will do that. Okay. Should be able to do it now, I think. All right, let me see if Zoom will allow me to do that. Looks like it will. Okay, so in a moment, you should see my shared screen. Uh, this is a still photograph of the moon taken about the same time as the video you saw uh, earlier tonight. Can you see my, can you see my screen? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Very good. So, whoops, that's not what I wanted. Uh, let's go ahead. And as, as we mentioned in the video, we were looking in the area of the sea of tranquility here into Southern end down this area here is where the Apollo 11 landing site is. And then up here, this upper end, actually in the southern area of the Sea of Serenity, or the very northern edge of the Sea of Tranquility, that is where the Apollo 17 landing site's located. So let's, uh, let's see if we can zoom in a little bit in this area here. This might be a little bit sharper than, than what we saw, a little bit larger than what we saw in the video earlier. Once again, we see the large, the flat lava plains of the Sea of Tranquility. We have this uh, promontory of uh, highlands sticking out here at the sh at the edge of the Sea of Tranquility. We have this uh, this crater called Moltke here, and it's really, as I mentioned earlier, in this area right in here is where the uh, Apollo 11. Apollo 11 astronauts landed and spent a little over two hours in one, uh, in only one um, excursion, extra vehicular uh, excursion, meaning outside the spacecraft. Now, if we go up to the upper side here, at the southern shores of the Sea of uh, Serenity here and in the northern part of the Sea of Tranquility, this is where we have the Apollo 17 landing site. And it is easy to get to get disoriented here a little bit, but uh, I was I think in the video I was pointing over here, but in actual fact the the landing zone really is is in this area right in here. This is the south mastiff, and this is the north mastiff. And if actually if we go to a a similar scale, this is Google Moon, and what we'll do is we'll we'll zoom in on the Apollo. 17 landing site here. Once again, here's uh, Apollo 11 landing site. Here's 
Sea of Tranquility. Here's the Sea of Serenity up here. And we're gonna let Google Moon zoom in for us here onto, uh, onto the landing site area. There we go. And we'll, we'll back it off a little bit so we get a little bit of perspective. Uh, so here's that South Mastiff and here's this North Mastiff here. This is around 7,000 feet above the landing zone for Apollo 17 and it's about 3,000 feet here. And the distance they traveled, let's say from here over to here is about seven miles and they did that mostly by, by the lunar rover. In total, all their round trips, I think they spent, uh, they went on three separate uh, EVAs as they call them. Uh, they spent almost a full day out on EVA, some pretty long days spent walking around in, 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 in those uh, spacesuits. But I think about a total of 26 miles was the, uh, was the total distance there um, that they, uh, they traveled while they were on the moon. So you can kind of see this South Mastiff and this North Mastiff. And I go, if I go back to this site, this one here, we're really looking at right in this notch, right in here. That's, that's where the, the Apollo 17 uh, landing site was located. So I just wanted to, wanted to point that out. It's a little bit easier to see on a still photograph than it is on the, whoops, on the video. Um, so I wanted to show that to you. Okay, that's great, Mark. We want to finish up here. We're just about running out of time. and I want to make sure we have a little bit of time just to finish for some questions here. So if you'll stay on, Mark, let me share back to my screen and get a few more things here that I wanted to have Rich cover. Rich, are you there? Yes. All right. So, Rich, you want to talk about a few uh, July Sky events, right? Yes. Okay. Can you go ahead and do that? And uh, let me put you back to spotlight here. Okay. Let's see if I get myself back on there. Uh, video. There we go. Perfect. All right. Well, uh, as uh, I mentioned earlier in the Stellarium program, it is possible to see most of the planets this month. Uh, Jupiter and Saturn, remember folks, rise about in the southeastern sky around 10 o'clock uh, at the beginning of July, and then they'll be out pretty much all night long by the end of July. So those will be our big planets. Jupiter looks like a really bright star, in the, again, rising in the southeast. And then just a bit to the left is uh, dimmer Saturn. Uh, Saturn is much dimmer because it's twice as far away nearly a billion miles, and it, uh, it does, as you look at it, even though it's still quite bright in the sky, it just, uh, it just seems really far away. A good picture opportunity would be uh, uh, on the 4th of July, and also the 5th, the moon will be close to both of those planets. Uh, I also mentioned that a few hours later, around one in the morning, is when you start to see Mars in early July, and then as early as 11.30 by the end of the month in the southeast. And then Venus right before dawn. So go out about, uh, about 4.45 in the morning currently, look in the east. Uh, I like to walk my dog very early in the morning. So I have seen Venus uh, a couple of times. Uh, very, very bright star. And so it's quite easy for the next few weeks to see Venus, Mars, Jupiter and Saturn, and the moon will be close by uh, around the middle of July. If you want to make it five planets uh, later in July, you might see Mercury to the lower left of uh, Venus about an hour or 45 minutes before sunrise uh, uh, in the uh, northeastern sky uh, before dawn. You can move on to the next one. Uh, it's probably got a lot of attention in the media, but there does happen to be an eclipse of the moon on the night of the 4th of July. And uh, unfortunately, the media doesn't always take into account of uh, how visible it actually is. Uh, but there will be about 1130 at night would be the best time to look what's called the penumbral eclipse of the moon on the night of the 4th of July. Uh, I happen to live in a neighborhood where a lot of people shoot off fireworks, so even if I wanted to go to sleep at that hour, uh, I probably couldn't, 
Uh, unfortunately, though, the moon misses the dark umbral shadow, and it only just barely even dips into the penumbra. So the picture on the right of the two, and I don't have a, I don't have the ability to uh, use a pointer, but the picture on the right of the two, you might notice, has just a slight shading on the upper edge of the moon, and uh, I'm not even sure you'll get that much. Uh, but you can try the evening of the 4th of July, about 1130 at night, you might see a slight trace, a very uh, unfortunate, kind of a duh, the minor eclipse of the moon. However, there's one more thing that will be possibly pretty cool. If we're lucky enough to see it, we'll move on to the uh, last thing we'll talk about. Uh, way back at the end of March, the uh, Near-Earth Orbit Wide Field Infrared Survey Explorer, which they thankfully have shortened to NEOWISE, uh, discovered a comet. Uh, NEOWISE uh, originally was uh, 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 supposed to uh, look for infrared objects in the sky, and then it was later repurposed to look for near-Earth objects. And uh, this comet uh, received a designation of uh, C2020, so Comet 2020F3. And it looks like there's a chance that it might become moderately bright. Uh, it's going to be closest to the sun in just a few days on July 3rd, uh, a little bit closer than Mercury is to the sun. And uh, that's kind of a two-edged sword. It means that the comet will receive enough heat and light to possibly become bright. However, comets that venture too close to the sun often get, uh, get uh, dissolved. It's, uh, their gases uh, uh, get uh, vaporized and the uh, comet disintegrates. In fact, earlier uh, this spring, comet Atlas and comet Swan were both thought to possibly become impressive, and they both uh, went poof. Hopefully, this won't happen to Neowise. Now, you might ask, where is Comet Neowise right now? Uh, it is close to the sun, but there is a satellite called SOHO, which blocks out the, uh, the uh, sun with what's called an occulting disk and lets you see stars and objects near it. And so as of yesterday, Comet Neowise seemed to be doing pretty well, uh, even uh, through the sun's heat. So hopefully it will, uh, hopefully it will survive and emerge into the view. I think I have uh, two more pictures left so if we move to the next one. If Neowise does survive, uh, around July 10th through July 15th, uh, that's only a week after it's closest to the sun. It might be visible extremely low in the northeastern sky. Uh, if you get up about, uh, about four in the morning, unfortunately, a lot of these things always happen before dawn. You could use Venus and the bright star Capella as a guide uh, and uh, look possibly for Comet Neowise just above the northeastern horizon about 4 a.m., on the uh, around the July 10th to 15th period. This picture shows July 10th from the Stellarium program. Again, it's really difficult to know how bright the comet will become, how well it will retain any brightness it, it gets, uh, but there's a chance, and that's why I'm mentioning it will probably get some media attention, there's a chance it may put on a pretty good show. Comets always benefit from uh, going to dark sky locations if you possibly can, uh, and you definitely are going to have to find a good view to the northeast. However, a few days later, you don't have to get up early. You could see it in the evening, and the final slide uh, shows as we move down to that, that uh, around July 15th and later, uh, it'll be in the evening. And again, I'm really crossing my fingers that it might stay fairly bright, but directly below the Big Dipper in the northwestern sky around 10 p.m. Uh, this particular picture shows July 20th when it's a little higher in the sky. So let's cross our fingers. If you want to check out how Comet Neowise is doing, I mentioned a couple of websites, skyandtelescope.com or spaceweather.com. 
And I'm also going to keep tabs on it uh, at the Gateway Arch NPS Facebook page. Uh, I should mention that tonight's video uh, will be posted to the uh, Astronomical Society and the uh, Dark Sky Association uh, websites. And then in a day or two, it's going to be posted to our National Park Service Facebook page, and it's going to have captions uh, and uh, audio description so everybody could access it. So uh, you might tell your friends, uh, anyone who might uh, benefit from captions or audio description that tonight's program uh, will be, uh, will be, uh, uh, will be uh, uh, captioned and uh, audio descriptive. So that's uh, just a few things coming up in the sky. Again, we'll cross our fingers about the comet, but always some nice planets and a minor eclipse. Okay, Rich. Uh, so I know we've run a little bit over here. Do you want to, this is your program, really. Do you want to take sure. a few questions from the folks? I I'm actually haven't had a chance to look because of the way the screens here work. I got to see if there's any, I see a lot of comments out there. Sure. Uh, let's see what we got. If anybody has any uh, questions? I see a lot of comments. I saw a, a comet as a kid and that's really cool. Uh, I saw a question about uh, a while ago about is there a solar flare coming up and will that affect electronics? Is it to Mark or Rich, do you guys know how to answer that question? A solar flare and it, will it, uh, is there one coming up and will it affect the electronics? Well, solar flares are pretty unpredictable. Unfortunately, the sun is at a very low ebb of its cycle. It has an 11 year cycle of activity. And so there have been very few uh, large uh, solar flares actually for the last couple of years. Uh, you really can't predict them. Uh, as the uh, cycle gets more active in the next few years, we'll probably start to see more solar flares. So it's always possible we could have one, but a major solar flare is probably uh, you know, unlikely, but you never know. Have anything to add, Mark? Well, I would say that there's a, a really great website out there. It's called spaceweather.com. Yes. And on that website, they track uh, solar activity. And that's part of what generates space weather is our sun. Our sun is our major contributor to what they call weather in space. And so uh, if you follow that website, you'll, you'll get alerts on when aurora might be visible. And they're very rare here in St. Louis. You have to be well north of St. Louis. But if there are any, uh, and they usually occur when there are uh, large or major solar flare activities, uh, they'll alert you on the spaceweather.com website. So I would recommend you go, go there as your first source for that information. Very rarely a solar flare can uh, interact with the Earth's magnetic field and cause a aurora display and uh, on rare occasions it does make it uh, all the way down to uh, St. Louis. I've seen uh, a couple of them down here. Of course they're much more common in the northern United States and, and Canada closer to the magnetic pole but uh, perhaps in the next few years as the solar uh, cycle heats up there could be a, a chance. They're quite rare in St. Louis of, a, of an aurora display. So I, I see three. so I see a comment here about the Milky Way galaxy alone contains approximately 100 billion stars and we haven't scratched the surface yet. There are many more galaxies. And also one here about the Kohotek comet, the Christmas comet. Someone saw that at age 19. Yes, comet Kohotek. And unfortunately, I, I can remember that very well. Many people got excited about it. Uh, it actually did become quite bright uh, very briefly, and unfortunately, it faded quite rapidly. And by the time it got into decent visibility, a couple of weeks after closest approach of the sun, it already faded. I remember looking at it. I was, uh, I think I was 12 years old at the time. My mom and I took a look, and in suburban Chicago, we weren't even uh, able to uh, able to find it. And hopefully. Uh, uh, Comet Neowise will retain whatever brightness it gets. And I should mention, it's not expected to be brilliant, but possibly 
visible to the unaided eye. So without telescope or binoculars, especially if you get out away from the city lights. So it's not going to be a brilliant, dazzling thing, but it's actually fairly rare to see a, a comet just to your unaided eye. So we'll have to see about that one. All right, looks like we're getting mostly just comments right now. So I think we could probably wrap up, Rich and Mark and uh, Ken, if you're, I think you're still out there. So, wow, this is pretty cool. Unless you, you got anything else to add, uh, Rich or Mark or Ken? Well, I'd like to thank everybody for their uh, great attention. It's been you know, wonderful presenting this to you. And thanks to Mark and Don and to uh, Ken Porter. And uh, we look forward to seeing you in uh, four weeks from tonight, July 25th. Again, keep track of us on the Gateway Arch NPS Facebook page to uh, see the format of the program. This will be more of a children's program, the Junior Ranger Night Explorer patch. Uh, depending on the pandemic conditions, we are not certain if it will be possible to be an in-person program or if it will be uh, another virtual event. So keep track of us on Facebook and once again, Thank you to everyone. Yeah, and once again, don't forget to check out slasonline.org for the St. Louis Astronomical Society or darkskymissouri.org for the International Dark Sky Chapter of Missouri. And IDA Missouri will actually, if you check the Facebook, I'm sorry, the uh, YouTube channel tomorrow, I will have this posted out there as a live video. So, or at least, so we really thank you, everybody. Have a great evening. And once again, thank you for joining us.